and Mike, thank you for having me here. You can hear me clearly? Yes, very good, thank you. Very good. Well, thanks for everyone. I'm delighted to be back at the Asian Women Leadership Summit this year. I'm even more delighted to see that there are so many leaders, uh, new men and women who have all come together to advance women in the workplace. And I think just being here today, we're all making a statement about what we value, that we value parity and equality, and we recognise that we do need to change the pace of achieving this equality. Societies and workplaces are just not changing fast enough. And of course, now the pandemic has put in place new challenges that are actually having a disproportionate impact on women. And we don't want to erode that progress that we've started to see over the last few decades. So knowing that everybody is assembled here and sharing this common value and belief, I have been wrestling a little bit with the title of this talk um, and perhaps the content. With a subject heading like, is perfectionism killing your career? I did worry that I'm victim blaming women and perhaps not supporting or accelerating the change necessary for gender equality. So if you'll allow me over the next um, eight or, or 10 minutes to please explain this a little bit further. Um, and then like we've heard from, from others, I'll use some of my own experiences as an example um, to describe the premise of my argument that aspiring to perfectionism, personally or professionally, can be career limiting, not enhancing. Um, and I appreciate this may be a little bit contentious. So uh, as Mike outlined, we have 10 minutes at the end for discussion uh, and for Q&A, and I'd very much welcome any of your questions. So let me start with a personal story. Um, during my career, I've worked in both part-time and full-time roles. Uh, specifically when my children were young, I made the decision that I'd have 40 plus years to work, but I'd only have a few years of young children. So I took nearly 12 months off after the birth of each of my three kids, and then I worked eight years part-time um, across that entire period. Um, and even back then, I'm dating myself a bit, Mercer did offer a lot of flexibility, so I was able to work flexibly while still doing interesting roles that helped challenge me and helped me to learn. Now, without going into too much detail, my third child was particularly clingy. Uh, he did not like me to be out of his sight. He would cry endlessly if I left the house without him. By the time he was 18 months, I had managed to get myself back to work two to three days a week. But frankly, every workday was just heart wrenching and stressful. My workday routine at the time, and still is now, is to get up and, and grab a coffee and have a shower. But literally, when my son heard that shower turn on, he would run into the bathroom, he would get into the shower, he would sit on the shower floor and cling to my legs. And while, of course, he's clinging to my legs, he's pulling on my heartstrings, and it was a pretty tough way to start every workday. One day, having wrestled my wet 18-month-year-old out of the shower, I did detach him from uh, my leg. I made it to work, when I, and I was asked to meet with our CEO. And he proceeded to discuss some upcoming organisational changes and he shared with me that he wanted me to take on the role of Chief Customer Officer for the firm. Lead, this, would mean involve, this would involve leading the end-to-end -end customer experience for a retail retirement savings business that served over 2 million customers at the time. And this was everything through the, from the customer segmentation through to the marketing to the customers, right through to running the call centre and a regulated financial advice team. Um, now, this was my dream job at the time. I had always wanted it, uh, but clearly it was a role that couldn't be done in two or three days a week. So by the time I got home that night to my sobbing 18 month year old and my two other children, um, I had established in my head an extremely long list of reasons why I could not do the job. And so after dinner, I shared the news with my husband and I proceeded to spend an hour telling him all the reasons why I couldn't do the job. The kids needed me. It was the wrong time. Our youngest son wouldn't cope without me. We didn't have a nanny. The business team wasn't in place already. It was gonna be a turnaround. I didn't have digital experience. I hadn't run a call center. The list went on and on. And I had literally spent all day working through this list of reasons why I couldn't do the job. Um, my husband listened patiently, um, probably for as long as he could stand it. Um, and then he challenged me fairly bluntly. 
Um, he said, I don't understand why they've offered you the job if you're not qualified or able to do the job. And then basically he told me that I was being daft. He said that our kids will be fine. We'll take it one day at a time, we'll sort it out. He said, yes, you're right. Your customer experience does need to get overhauled, but you've been complaining about this for the last two years. So now's your chance to actually do something about it. He said, yes, you'll need new people in your team. So go ahead and hire all of those people you need to be successful. And you're right, you probably don't have enough digital experience, nor do you know how to run a call centre, but you're smart, you'll learn, and you'll hire the brightest people for the team. And so this was uh, my aha moment, if you like. I realised that I had spent literally hours or the whole day putting my energy into listing all the reasons that I wasn't the perfect candidate for the job. And I'd put virtually no time into listing the reasons why I was qualified and why I was capable. And so this was my first realization that this aspiring to be perfect and to have 100% of all of the criteria could actually kill my career. If I hadn't had the good counsel at the time, I may well have declined the role. And it actually turned out to be the most pivotal and important role of my career because it opened up a whole new world of learning, a whole new network, and really helped me to develop the skills um, you know, that I need today for the, the job that I love today as well. I would also like to say that this was the only experience, but when I sat down and reflected on my career, I realized I'd actually done this a lot. I put a lot of effort into thinking about why something wasn't perfect instead of being bold and confident, or at least confident enough in my abilities to learn, to go ahead and to try and be successful. So this is why I'm conscious of not letting perfectionism derail my career or those around me, and why I worry that aspiring to perfectionism can really result in women underestimating and undervaluing their own abilities. And I think this is evident in a lot of studies as well. So we all know the original HP study that said that women are likely to apply for a role or won't apply for the role unless they meet 100% of the job criteria. Men, however, will apply if they meet 60% of the job criteria. We also know that women are less likely to put themselves forward for promotions proactively. They're less likely to ask proactively for pay rises as well. Um, they're less likely to also ask for managerial positions and people management positions. And I think these are all examples of women undervaluing their own abilities and capability. And I love the way that Hillary Clinton um, shared it fairly famously uh, in the quote that um, when I say to a young woman, I want you to take on this extra responsibility, almost invariably she says, do you think I'm ready? But when I ask a man, he says, how high, how fast, and when do I start? So the man in this instant isn't even thinking about his suitability for the role, let alone whether he's perfectly suited for all of that additional responsibility. And so in support of all of this throughout my career, I've noticed what I've done, but I also note, note also that many women um, also seem to um, undervalue and underestimate their abilities and spend too much time agonizing about why they can't do a role rather than challenging the energy into I can do this or I can make this work. Now this has actually got a term um, so Bob Sullivan and Hugh Thompson actually termed this phenomenon the plateau effect and they detailed it in their book of the same name of 2013 um, that came out. And they call this tendency the enemy of good, and it leads to hours of wasted time. And then worse still, they propose that this tendency for perfection actually transcends the workplace and can play out in a woman's life and career more broadly. They argue that women focus too much energy on becoming the best at whatever life throws at them, best at motherhood or at their new job or at their new hobby and that this focus on 100% or this focus on perfect actually results in more self-doubt and shutting out new possibilities. 
And then they argue that spending uh, wasted energy exploring all of these what if scenarios, finding all of the reasons why they shouldn't do something or why they might not be successful, they should actually be channeling that same amount of energy into believing in themselves, building self-confidence and being open to possibility. And that if women believed in their ability and values more, could we radically change the existing workforce dynamic? So this is the reason that I wanted to talk about the topic today, um, although it's potentially uh, contentious and we can talk about that in a few moments. But I think it's important that we're aware of this, that awareness is half the battle won. Knowing that it's there, that it's backed by some science, and it's not just you as an individual as a starting point. Um, and then from a starting point, you can start to correct for it. And you can start in whatever way you're comfortable, leaning in a bit more, putting your hand up a bit more, or just catching yourself with a negative thought and turning it into a positive so that you believe in yourself more. For me, taking that customer experience job was the best career decision I ever made. Then making the next big leap that was offered to me in my career um, was also uh, both career and life changing. Now that next leap, I actually spent weeks agonizing about why I couldn't do it. Uh, the next leap was a, a move to the, uh, a new role and a move to New York. Um, it turned out to be the best career and life decisions that I've ever made, both for me and my family. But I admit again that I spent more time agonizing about why it couldn't work or wouldn't work than I spent about thinking about how to make it successful. So I guess I urge all of you here today to not let perfectionism kill or limit your career, uh, to go forward, be bold, believe in your abilities and believe in your value. You may not be successful every time, but I bet you'll be successful the majority of times that you try. So please uh, be aware of that, go forward um, and be bold. So with that, um, I hope that that has stimulated some thought uh, and hopefully some questions there as well. And I'm happy to, to take any of those questions. Um, I'm just having a scan through them now. And I think Mike, you're coming back to join us also. Yes, thank you very much for that uh, fantastic presentation. And we have uh, a wonderful comment here from uh, Marion. I'm not sure if I'm saying this right. Oh, May. Oh, May. Oh, my God. I know this exactly. My husband literally pushed me to two positions already. It was already mentioned in an earlier panel. The right partner is so important. And that's absolutely true. But obviously, there's things that companies can do. So what would have helped you uh, from the company is I just one thing that you mentioned was that a position description may not fit you 100%. Maybe if companies just simply wrote, you know, you need to meet, you know, 80% of uh, what's written here, or you don't need to meet everything or something to be more encouraging. That seems like one simple way of, of addressing that and also choosing uh, people specifically for a role and suggesting that they participate. I've been in organizations that have done that because they want more representation from women so they will reach out to them and encourage them to, to join or sign up for something. So what are your thoughts on that, uh, Ms. McGill? Yeah, um, look, it's, it's a, a great point. I mean, for me, position descriptions are just that. They're a description of a role. Um, I think the big learning for me personally was, you know, through those eight years of part time doing different roles was that um, I learned to focus more on the outcomes rather than the description or the inputs. Um, and so having really frank and direct conversations with my manager and with the organisation around what are the expectations of the role, what are the intended outcomes and getting really clear down to, you know, by the end of this year, what does success look like for you? So that we're being really clear about those outcomes. Um, and if you've, if you've got a good organisation or if you're trying to, to run an organisation that do this, then you need to trust people to manage the inputs so long as they're delivering those outcomes and then they can make it work in a way that works for them as well. So 
I think that's that's the, the big learning that I had and certainly you know, what I would encourage others to do as well. And the other thing that I found was very uh, curious in your talk was that um, it's not just about perfectionism of needing a particular job description, but also how you perform your work. And uh, you suggested that people who try to be too much of a perfectionist may get stuck in a certain area. Do, have I quoted you correctly? Have I summarized that in, in the right way? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, again, contentious, and I think we could probably debate this type of thing, but I think it's a challenge for any individual, and I'm, I'm calling out women because I think, you know, they take a disproportionate um, path in, in like this, um, that when we, try to be perfect at everything we do i mean it it's not impossible nobody can be perfect at everything that they do um but when you try and you try and do all of those things um there are going to be things that fall through the cracks and what my concern is that is that women start to doubt their own abilities more broadly because they're trying to be perfect across so many areas and if you start to doubt your abilities more broadly um, then you're starting again to underestimate your value, to underestimate what you can do going forward. And it can become a little bit of a, a dangerous cycle. So um, for me, it's a lot more of, of going with the flow, I think, and being realistic about what you can, can do. And that, you know, good enough might be good enough. Um, and it doesn't have to be 100% 100% perfect all the time. Thanks, we have a minute for one last question. How do we differentiate between risks and life-changing career moves for working mothers. <laughs> we wrestled with uh, wrestled with that one a lot, um, particularly uprooting, you know, three children, a husband, and two dogs, and moving them to, to New York from from Australia. Um, look, I think you've got to take in your own personal circumstances as well. You've got to be um, very clear about the role, and is the role set up for success? Is the organisation going to support you to be successful? And then you've got to assess your own personal circumstances as well. You know, what does what happens if everything goes wrong? Um, and, you know, can you manage that that outcome and have a bit of a plan for that as your backup plan? And you've just got to take it all in context like that. Thank you so much, Ms. McGowan. We're out of time now. We'd love to talk to you much longer. And there are a lot of great questions from the audience, which I'm sure that Quest conferences will compile after this session because there are so many important issues that people want to hear more about. And of course, we will have more conferences in the future. Thank you again so much. Pleasure. Lovely to be here. Thank you.